morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We're continuing with our reading and discussion of the book, The Footprints of the Jesuits, by R.W. Thompson. And in this portion of this the, the current chapter, R.W. Thompson is rationalizing the equivocation of Pope Pius VI. Remember, Clement XIV, Pius VI's predecessor, suppressed the Jesuits and abolished them by a papal bull. And his immediate successor, Pope Pius VI, equivocates. And R.W. Thompson goes to a great effort to explain or challenge this equivocation, bringing into question the, so, the, the apparent contradiction between Pope Pius VI and Clement XIV. But let me remind the listeners something before we continue the reading. First of all, an infallible Pope, Pope Paul III, in 1540, approved the, the Jesuits and established them as a monastic order of the Roman Catholic Church. And the only concession that Pope Paul III made to the Jesuits was that they would go wheresoever in the world that he commanded them to go. Now, first of all, R.W. Thompson is going to suggest that the Jesuits found refuge in Russia because the Pope had no jurisdiction there. Well, how much jurisdiction would the Pope relinquish being the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, who claims to be by divine right the sole sovereign of the world, and that every man, woman, and child on the planet must bend his knee to the Pope in order to be saved? What portion of the world would he not claim jurisdiction? Russia? Not hardly. What we're seeing here is what I am convinced is a concerted effort by the papacy and, uh, and the Jesuit order to extend the, the realm of operations of the Jesuits, while at the same time, making it appear to the world that the Jesuits have been suppressed and that the papacy is against the Jesuits, when in fact they can't live without one another. And th all of this takes place during the most critical period in time, that is the formation of our constitutional republic in the United States of America. That the Jesuits, while they were reviled and hated among the Roman Catholic nations of Europe, while Pope Clement XIV, in response to that, to the, the universal odium against the Jesuits, has opened up foreign lands where supposedly the Pope has no jurisdiction obviously hoping that we forget the idea that the Pope claims the whole world as his jurisdiction. I think all of this is a cover, all of this is a ruse to hide or cloak uh, the expansion, the global expansion of the Jesuit order. And with all of that said, we'll continue uh, backing up to the beginning of the paragraph where we concluded last time this is the first full paragraph on page 242, if you're following along in your own copy of the book. It says, The Jesuits, however, draw inference from the favorable estimate of their society by Pope Pius, VII, Pope Pius VI for his kind treatment of Richie, the general, while confined at the castle of St. Angelo, and his release from confinement of the other Jesuits who had been arrested. This is far-fetched inasmuch as it may well be attributable alone to motives of benevolence. But in no event are these such acts as could limit in the least degree the effect of the decree of abolition so long as it contain, uh, continued in force, and it did during the pontificate of Pius VI. Besides, the propriety of punishing individuals must have depended upon their personal agency in the offenses charged against the society 
as an organized body. The Jesuits derive more support for their claim that Pius VI favored them by quoting language alleged to have been uttered by him, which, if actually spoken, would place him in the attitude of being upon their side and condemning the decree of his predecessor, but without the courage to relieve them from the condemnation of their conduct or from the act of suppression. In other words, accusing Pope Pius VI of being a coward. And it says, this is not complimentary to Pius VI, for it represents him as saying, quote, I approve of the Society of Jesus residing in white Russia, unquote, at the same time that he continued his assent to their abolition in all the Roman Catholic states. The question whether or not he made this remark is in too much doubt to give full credit to it. It is not pretended that the words were written, but only that they were spoken in the presence of a single witness who is said to have attested their utterance. This would place him in the attitude of performing a public act contrary to his private judgment, which might well enough be done where temporal matters only were involved, but not by a pope concerning spiritual matters. Hence it is scarcely to be supposed that Pope Pius VI ever uttered these words. But they amount to nothing which reaches the dignity of an official act if he did, for the plain reason that the decree of abolition, having been a solemn official act under the seal of the fishermen, if, if, if subject at all to revocation or modification by any of the successors of Clement XIV, could only have been so dealt with by an official act of corresponding solemnity. Okay, apparently been disconnected and reconnected. I uh, must have some interference on the line. I'm not sure what it is, but maybe we'll look into it. Anyway, but they amount to nothing which reaches the dignity of an official act if he did for the plain reason that the decree of abolition, having been a solemn official act under the seal of the fishermen, if subject at all to revocation or modification by any of the successors of Pope Clement XIV, could only have been so dealt with by an official act of corresponding solemnity. In other words, if Clement XIV, by a papal bull, suppressed the Jesuit order, it would take an equivalent papal bull to reinstate them. And it says, for some causes, judicial decrees may be changed or annulled, but only by other judicial decrees, and it'll not be pretended, even by the Jesuits, that a decree pronounced by a pope under the authority of canon law and the unvarying custom of the church is of less dignity than the decrees of civil courts. What is said by de Montor disproves the allegation of Dorniac. He tells us that when the Jesuit general in Russia took steps as would have enlarged the society by the admission of neophytes, Pope Pius VI commanded him to cease. Pope Pius VI commanded the Jesuit general in Russia to cease? I thought the Pope didn't have any jurisdiction in Russia. Look, the Pope has jurisdiction over the Jesuits only so long as the Jesuit general acknowledges that jurisdiction. And when the Jesuit general decides not to acknowledge the jurisdiction of the papacy, he doesn't. And the Jesuit general can do whatever he pleases. Now it says, whilst in this he does not seem to have commanded the, uh, condemned the existence of the Jesuits in Russia, it emphatically approves the decree of abolition by executing it elsewhere. Not to condemn their existence in Russia was a simple act of omission, differing essentially from a direct approval. But whether what he did was the one or the other, it undoubtedly had the effect of enabling the Jesuits in Russia to defy the decree of Pope Clement XIV by keeping their organization alive there so that at the death of General Ritchie, they elected a successor of their own 
who conducted himself and the society in open opposition to the church, the pope, and Roman Catholic canon law. All there that can be justly said about Pope Pius VI is that he occupied an equivocal attitude, not willing to approve directly by any official act the existence of the society in Russia, yet leaving the decree of suppression in full force. You see, this equivocation is not equivocation at all. Pope Pius VI has to placate his Roman Catholic supporters in Europe by suppressing the Jesuits. But Pope Pius VI understands that the bark of Peter cannot challenge the waves of the seas without the Jesuit rowers to prepare the way. The Pope's global government can only succeed with the help of the Jesuit order. Now, while they have been kicked out of every Roman Catholic country in the world, they've been injected into all the other countries of the world, and the popes are equivocal about this. Why? Because the very constitution of the Jesuits says that they will go everywhere in the world to destroy Protestantism and to topple all governments not amenable to the papacy. Now, Russia had been a place where the the Eastern Orthodox Church had been coddled. As a matter of fact, it had become the state religion. A challenger to the Roman Catholic Church's claim to the universal church. So the Jesuits, during this period of odium in Europe, having already messed in their bed in Europe, had been kicked out and supposedly suppressed, they immediately went to Russia. And they came to the United States, too. Okay? Both heretical nations. They just expanded the, 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 the theater of operations for the Jesuits, while at the same time appearing that the Jesuits had received a quote-unquote mortal wound. Right? It's blown cover as cover, is what uh, the author of the, of the book Rulers of Evil says. This is their Sun Tzu and war strategy to appear to be defeated while at the very at the very time of their apparent defeat, they are expanding and conquering like nowhere else before. Now, he says, but whatever Pope Pius VI may have done or said, his immediate successor, Pope Pius VII, did authorize the Jesuits to establish themselves in white Russia. Okay? So we're, we're seeing just equivocation by Pope, Paul, uh, Pope Pius VI, but Pope Pius VII throws away all pretense and gives the, Russia, uh, gives the Jesuits authority to continue in white Russia. <clears throat> it says this he did in 1801, only 28, uh, excuse me, 28 years after the, the the decree of Pope Clement the Fourteenth, abolishing the Jesuits. It was not done, however, by a mere verbal declaration to that effect, but by a former, a formal bull or brief or a decree, no matter by what name it may be called, in observance of the usual formality. <clears throat> so that he formally, by a decree, an official papal document, gave authorization of the Jesuits to operate in Russia. And it's from, it says, from this, it is, it is to be implied that there had been no attempt to change or limit the decree of suppression by Pope Pius, Pius VI. For if there had been, this repetition would have been unnecessary. Pope Pius VII manifestly understood that without the official solemnity of a new bull, brief, or a decree, no effect would have been followed. That is, that his mere verbal assent, if he had given it, would have amounted to nothing. But what he did was equivocal, to say the least of it, by both affirming and disaffirming the decree of Pope Clement XIV. 
it affirmed it in so far as the decree was left in force in the Roman Catholic sta- in the Roman Catholic states of Europe, where the jurisdiction of the Pope as the head of the Church was recognized, and disaffirmed it in Russia, where the Pope had eh, no jurisdiction. Okay, the Pope had no jurisdiction in Russia. This is for public consumption, obviously. The Pope is not going to concede any area of the world where he does not have jurisdiction. Now, it was as much as to say that the Jesuits should not exist as an organized society among Roman Catholics, but might do so among schismatics and heretics. Okay, you see where this is? See what this is? It's an expansion of the Jesuits according to their own constitution, whether they are to operate to destroy heretical and schismatic nations and kings and governments. Okay, they've got big plans for Russia, just as they had big plans for the United States of America. And whether the Pope gave them uh, liberty or approval to go to these areas or not is irrelevant. The Jesuits are going to do what the Jesuits are going to do. And it says no matter what idea he he, in, he intended to convey with regard to their abolition among the former, that is the Roman Catholic nations of Europe, he accepted it as an accomplished fact that he was officially bound to recognize To have done otherwise would have been perilous to the church by inciting the opposition of the Roman Catholic sovereigns who could not be reconciled to the Jesuits and would have offended the multitude of European Christians, you you might say Roman Catholics, who had approved their abolition. So, the Pope's trying to butter both sides of his bread. He's trying to keep the Catholics happy in Europe who hate the Jesuits and want them extinguished, but he wants to placate the Jesuits and give them new areas of operation. Okay? This is not difficult to understand. And he says, Up to the first year of the present century, therefore, the decree of Pope Clement the Fourteenth remained unreversed throughout Europe and wheresoever the jurisdiction of the Pope was recognized. Okay? And it says, whatsoever the Jesuits did to resist, defeat, or evade it must consequently be considered willful disobedience to the recognized and legitimate authority of the church. In other words, as rebellion. Now look, if the papacy, or even for that matter, Roman Catholic Europe, had seen the Jesuits as rebels, equivalent to the Protestants, well, they would have opened the Inquisition for the Jesuits, wouldn't they? They would have burned them at the stake. They would have interrogated them and tortured them and forced them to, to admit rebellion against the church and then killed them for heresy, right? But that didn't happen, did it? See, there's something, there's something going on here that's not explained even by R.W. Thompson. Now, he says, this measure of leniency on the part of Pius VII had the effect upon the Jesuits of making them bolder in their general conduct and more vindictive in their denunciation of Pope Clement XIV, whose name and memory they assailed with fierce and foul aspirations. They flocked to Russia in large numbers, as they had done to, to Cilicia, from all the Roman Catholic states and under the guidance of their skillful general in that country, soon acquired the habit of acting as if they were sure of an an ultimate revival of their organization. Why? (laughs) Because they know that the papacy cannot survive without them. They can even kill popes that won't cooperate with them and get by with it. And they're just biding their time and working double time in new areas to conquer. He says, thus sustained, it was not long before they re-entered Parma and Sicily with the implied, if not the express, approval of Pope Pius VII, 
who seemed to have been gradually preparing himself by cautiously feeling his way to espouse their cause and to acquiesce in their defamation of Clement the Fourteenth. As their hopes grew higher, they began to repeat their old practices by venturing it, uh, by venturing to interfere with the temporal affairs of governments as they had been accustomed to do before their suppression. In other words, the Jesuits, being led by the, the, the very voice of God in the Jesuit general, cannot change. They're infallible. Their area of operations is government intrigue to get control of the governments of the world, to conquer them from within, and to get them to acquiesce to a global government. And the Roman Catholic Church has been trying to build a global government for the Pope almost since the very inception uh, of the papacy. Claiming himself the divine right to rule the world as the vicar of Christ, this has been the the unswerving goal of the papacy. And no one is more astute at accomplishing that goal than is the Jesuit general or the Jesuit order, the rowers of the papal bark. Okay? The militia for the Pope. He says they ventured the attempt to domineer in Russia as they had formerly done in Spain, France, Portugal, and elsewhere. Finding themselves for a time unrebuked by the Russian authorities, they carried this <clears throat> they carried this interference so far and became so exacting in their demands that the Russian government was compelled in self defense to impose restraints upon them. Okay? They found refuge in Russia, and now they have worn out their welcome already in Russia by doing the same thing in Russia that they've done in every country where they, where they resided. Interfered in government. And Russia, even after giving them protection from the bull, from the papal bull of suppression and extinction by Pope Clement XIV, they've expressed their gratitude by trying to topple the government or interfering in government affairs. It says, they had learned so well how to plot treason and rebellion in the Roman Catholic states as to make themselves familiar with all the artifices and instrumentalities most effective for those purposes, but their Russian field of operations presented difficulties they had not probably anticipated. The Pope, whether for or against them, had no power there, and they were required to deal only with the authorities of that government, the Russian government. Those authorities soon became convinced that they had warmed a viper into life, and that the Jesuits, <clears throat> the Jesuits could not be trusted even in return for favors bestowed upon them. The Russian Emperor Alexander was consequently compelled to issue a royal ukase, a royal decree in 1816, by which he expelled the Jesuits from St. Petersburg and Moscow. Okay? St. Petersburg representing the church and Moscow representing the government. Do you suppose they were meddling in church and state again? That's always what they do. It says, this proving ineffectual, he issued another ukase in 1820, excluding them entirely from the Russian dominions. Oh, we've come up on the break. I missed the cue. We'll come back right after the messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. One hundred days, one hundred subscribers at seven dollars will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. Seven dollars a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the gospel of the kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support. 
support.firstamendmentradio.com. In this day of economic uncertainty and soaring unemployment, safe investments are often hard to find. But investing in the precious metals is the safest investment of all because gold and silver is real money. Government printed currency is not. Call Melody Cedarstrom at Discount Gold and Silver Trading Company at 1-800-375-4188. Melody has been helping people secure their financial future for over 10 years. While others in the business claim honesty, Melody will deliver. Give her a call, 1-800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, Don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin, Rapture Origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you approve and appreciate Inquisition Update, please support it by supporting First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. It's a listener-supported program, and without your support, Inquisition Update cannot continue. So prayerfully support First Amendment Radio. And if you would like to email me with comments or questions, please do so at tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Now, I'm going to make a point here. It says Pope, uh, uh, the, the Emperor of Russia, Alexander, was consequently compelled to issue a royal decree in 1816. Notice the date, 1816. Notice that date in relation to the goings on in the colony, in the, in the United States, 1816, by which he expelled the Jesuits from St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, named after the Saint, after St. Peter, it's obviously uh, a center of power for the Eastern Orthodox Church, and he also expelled them from Moscow, the seat of the secular government. Okay, this represents church and state, St. Petersburg being the capital of the church, Moscow being the capital of the state. Okay, he expelled them from church and state. Why? Because they meddled in church and state. That's what they do everywhere they go. That's what they were doing in the in the United States during this same period of time. And the Russian Emperor Alexander expelled the Jesuits. <clears throat> First, from St. Petersburg and Moscow, kind of a shot over the bow of the bark of Peter, warning them, that if they continue to meddle in affairs of church and state, they were going to be out of here. 
just like they kicked them out of Spain, France, Portugal, Germany, every other Catholic nation in Europe, they were going to be expelled out of Russia by the emperor. Now, you have to ask yourself, if they had already achieved the same odium in Russia that they had achieved in all of Roman Catholic Europe, where was the odium for them in the United States? Are we to suppose that the Jesuits were not just as actively involved in interfering in the affairs of church and state in this country during this same period of time? Do we have a different flavor of Jesuits here in the United States of America, or is there something unique about this country that makes the Jesuits not odious or unfriendly, but friendly? I say it's a tenet of religious freedom embodied in our Constitution that the Jesuits took advantage of, and that very few people in this country had the, the audacity to criticize them. And that our government saw Catholics as being Christians and not what they are. The Church of Antichrist. You see, there's a blindness in this country that is demonstrated even during this period of time. While the Jesuits were expelled from every country in Europe, expelled even from Eastern Orthodox Russia, they, 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 were, they were free to operate without hindrance in this country and almost without criticism. You can't explain this by any other word than just blindness or in, unless it would be cowardice. Now, he expelled them. Alexander of Russia expelled the Jesuits from St. Petersburg and Moscow, church and state. This proving ineffectual, I mean, there's been no effectual attempt to suppress the Jesuits anywhere. If they are ever kicked out, as they were all over Europe, they always come back. The Jesuits never give up. They believe they have a divine right to conquer the whole world, and, and they cease to be Jesuits if they fail in that effort. Their Jesuit general is, is, as it were, Christ on earth, and they obey him with everything in their power to do so. It says, this proving ineffectual, he issued another ukase. case, this emperor uh, Alexander, issued another decree in 1820, excluding them entirely from the Russian dominions. Kicked them out. He gave them a four-year warning. After kicking them out of St. Petersburg and Moscow, they continued to meddle in affairs of church and state, and finally the Russian government kicked them out, just as did every other nation. And it says, The emperor set forth in his decree that he had entrusted them with the education of youth, Okay? He bestowed upon the Jesuits the favor that they always demand wherever they go to be the educators of the world. And being so good at their job of educating youth, the government, Alexander, approved them to educate the children of the nation. And he had imposed no restriction upon their right to profess and to practice their own religion, whatever that is, but that they had, quote, abused the confidence which was placed in them and misled their inexperienced pupils, unquote. That whilst they enjoyed toleration themselves, quote, listen to this, you have to ask yourself, are they not doing the very same thing in this country at this time? Quote, they implanted a hard intolerance in the natures infatuated by them. This is their students, right? They implanted a hard intolerance in the natures infatuated by them, and that all their efforts, quote, were directed merely to secure advantages for themselves, the Jesuits, and the extension of their power and their conscience found in every refractory action 
a convenient justification in their statutes. Unquote. After showing how insensible they were to the duties imposed on them by gratitude for the protection of Russia, uh, for the protection Russia had extended them after their abolition by the Pope, and charging them with the egregious crime of sowing tares and animosities among families, and tearing the son from the father and the daughter from the mother, Alexander asked this emphatic and significant question. Listen to this. Here's the question that Alexander, the emperor of Russia, asks. Quote, Where, in fact, is the state that would tolerate in its bosom those who sow in it hatred and discord? Unquote. Now, obviously, Alexander, the emperor of Russia, understood that the Jesuits were reviled in all of Europe. They, he gave them refuge in Russia. He gave them a job in Russia, that which they always demand to do to educate the children. And yet they continued to meddle in church and state until they completely lost their welcome in Russia and kicked them out. And he simply said, where in fact is the state that would tolerate in its bosom those who sow in it hatred and discord? Where is the state anywhere in the world that would tolerate the Jesuits? And here's the answer. Nowhere but in the United States of America. Where, in fact, is the state that would tolerate in its bosom those who sow in it hatred and discord? The United States of America. R.W. Thompson continues, he says, This was the first attempt made by any state not Roman Catholic to expel the Jesuits. And it is not pretended, even by the Jesuits themselves, that it was on account of their religion, which the Russian government allowed them to exercise freely. It must have been, therefore, the consequence of their having convinced the Russian authorities that they employed their religion as a pretext for their interference with temporal and political affairs and that they had thereby made themselves rightfully amenable to the charges alleged against them in the UK case against the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the emperor it is no defense against these charges to say that the emperor may have been mistaken this is not probable for the fact of their having plotted against the peace and interests of society in return for the favors he bestowed upon them would have justified him in condemning them even more severely. There are very few offenses so base as ingratitude, which includes the higher emotions, which excludes the higher emotions from the mind. He gave them shelter and protection after the Pope and the Roman Catholic powers of Europe had condemned and abolished them. And but for this, they would have passed away forever, overwhelmed by the popular indignation. The very fact that he found himself constrained to arraign them as he did with such crushing severity is convincing proof of their ingratitude as well as of their inability to exist anywhere in fidelity to their constitution without warring upon the peace of society and upon everything that they, uh, upon everything they are unable to subdue and to control. Okay? They attempted to subdue and to control Russia. Russia kicked them out. Just as did every other nation in the world. But what about the United States of America? What is it about the United States of America? You have to keep asking yourself this question. And remember, it's, it's R.W. Thompson's purpose to show us by all the examples throughout the, the Jesuits' history, through in every country that they ever resided, what ultimately became the position of the nations in regards to them. As justification 
that the United States should do the same thing if it's if it cares at all about its form of government, particularly a Protestant form of government, of, by, and for the people, in denial of the divine right of kings, then, then certainly we, out of all the nations previously mentioned, should have a case against the Jesuits. But where has the case been made? Except here in this book, R.W. Thompson. What, why, has not, why has not our government ever stood up against the Jesuits? Why has not our government ever objected to the interference of church and state in the United States of America? It's, it's a burning question that demands an answer. Now, the author continues, he says, It is to be presumed that the Jesuits professed submission to Russian authority before the, uh, before the decree of Pope Pius VII, which allowed them to exist in that country. But after the same pope reestablished the order, as he soon did, by another special decree, their schemes of ambition were more actively and openly plotted. This this last act, which restored them to active life, was dated on August 7th, 1814, and inasmuch as it enabled them to reproduce all their old machinery of mischief, it deserves to be well considered, both as regards the character of the act itself and the motives of its author. It constitutes one of the most important events in modern history. Let me read that again. The reestablishment of the Jesuits by Pope Pius VII constitutes one of the most important events in modern history. Look, unless you can view current events and future events, especially events involving the United States of America, you cannot understand unless you understand the importance of the reestablishment of the Jesuit order and their influence in this country. R. W. Thompson, Secretary of the American Navy, is telling us the reestablishment of the Jesuit order constitutes one of the most important events in modern history, the influences of which have not yet ceased and are not likely to cease so long as the contest between monarchism and popular government shall continue. Okay? Do we have a popular government in this country? Is it being overthrown? Is our government seeming to be more dictatorial? More monarchical in form? Does the President of the United States represent the people, or does he represent something else, or someone else? I maintain that the President of the United States doesn't even represent himself. He represents the papacy. He represents the the black papacy. And they're imposing... They are imposing monarchical rule in this country right before our very eyes. And we're all bewildered. We can't understand why our government seems to be against the people. When R.W. Thompson and so many of the other authors we read here on Inquisition Update are plainly telling us popular forms of government are going to have to be destroyed in order for the Jesuits to accomplish a global monarchy. And every nation in the world grew wise to this and rebelled against the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church, all except the United States of America. And now you know why the United States of America is known around the world as the uh, the world's police force. Meddling in the affairs of every government on the planet. They're not advancing your agenda or mine or Christ's heavenly kingdom. They are advancing a Jesuit kingdom, a global kingdom. A kingdom that is contrary, counterfeit, and satanic. 
a counterfeit Christianity. And they're doing it by force. When did Christ ever use force to save someone's soul, to convert someone to Christianity? When in all of God's word did he command us to use force to conquer the world for him? The United States is apostate. The government of the United States is apostate. uh, apostate. It is anti-Christian because of its Jesuit influence and because of the influence of of the Vatican in our government. And instead of rebelling against this, foreign influence through our government, this anti-Christ influence upon our government, the Christians, the so-called Protestants, have joined the ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. We are the most conquered nation on the planet. Every other nation on the planet had the ability to man up and kick the Jesuits out of the country, but not the United States. I'm criticized for being too critical and calling the ecumenical evangelibellies by their rightful name. Well, you can't win anybody to Christ by calling them ecumenical evangelibellies. That's not very Christian of you, Tom. You're supposed to be a Christian. Well, I call them what they are. I let the chips fall where they may. They're ecumenical. They're out of their minds, and they have no spine. It's time for the United States, particularly those who call themselves Protestants, to man up and kick the Antichrist out of this country. These same ecumenical evangelibellies that want to unite with the Roman Catholic Church and see nothing wrong with Jesuits controlling the halls of Congress controlling the the White House, controlling the Supreme Court. They see nothing wrong with that because their Christians need to wake up, just as did every other nation on the planet. It's up to God's people to stand up. Who's going to stand up if God's people don't stand up? What hope does this country have if we don't have the courage to stand up and demand that the Jesuits be expelled from this country and from our Congress and from the White House and the Supreme Court. What hope does this country have if it continues to recognize Roman Catholicism, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, as Christianity? The reinstitution of the Jesuits by Pope Pius the Seventh on August seventh, eighteen fourteen, just forty one years after their suppression by Pope Clement the Fourteenth in seventeen seventy three, a most critical time for this country, constitutes one of the most important events in modern history, the influences of which have not yet ceased and are not likely to cease so long as the contest between monarchism and popular institutions shall continue. Pope Pius VII was a monarchist in principle, besides being a temporal sovereign. Monarchism was seriously threatened and was ready to accept whatsoever alliance its defenders deemed essential to its preservation. Popular forms of government was the especial dread of kings. And there were none of these who did not undertake that nowhere else in the world was it more more severely condemned than in the Jesuit constitution. And none who would rejoice more at its extermination than the members of the Jesuit society. So all the monarchs, all those who believed in monarchism, the divine right of kings, which is finds its very root in the papacy. The papacy is the fountain of all divine writers because he is the divine right ruler of the world in their mind and they get their power and position and right to govern from the Pope. And it is nowhere more expressly uh, 
defended, that is monarchism, more expressly defended than in the Jesuit Constitution. And that's why they wanted the, the Jesuits restored. They suddenly realized that with the suppression of the Jesuits, they had given full freedom of Protestantism and popular forms of government. And that would ultimately end in the complete destruction of the Roman Catholic Church. They had to man all their guns to restore the monarchical power in the, in the world wherever Protestantism had overthrown it. And who did they first call upon? The Jesuits. He said, we should glance, therefore, at the condition of the European nations at the time of Pope Pius VII in order to penetrate his motives and comprehend what he must have regarded as the necessity which influenced him in aiding the Jesuits to cast reproach upon the memory of Pope Clement XIV, one of the most meritorious of his predecessors, says R.W. Thompson. I find nothing meritorious in Pope Clement XIV. I apologize for that. He's still the Antichrist. He was not a Christian. He arrogated to himself the prerogatives of God. He foisted a religion of works and not of grace. He denied Christ by replacing Christ. He was not benevolent. He was trying to save his own hide. All of Roman Catholic Europe hated the Jesuits, and they wanted them suppressed. And Pope Clement XIV gave them what they wanted. And he ended up being killed by the Jesuits. But I have no sympathy for Antichrist. It was no act of benevolence for the suppression of the Jesuits by Pope Clement XIV. It was a mere expedient. And so was their reinstatement by Pope Pius, the, by Pope Pius VII. There's nothing honorable about a diabolical system like the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuit order. To find anything of piety in the Church of Antichrist is to defy one's own intelligence. And I'll forgive R.W. Thompson, but not for us. We've got too much at stake. That's all we have for Inquisition Update today. We'll continue tomorrow. Stay tuned for more godly programming on First Amendment Radio. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's CrossTheBorder.org I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, 
the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordor.org.